if you get a side-on picture of an elite runner, their head is directly over their shoulders, which is directly over their pelvis in one tall position. Now they might have a very, very slight lean forward, but it's only very slight. The Triathlon Show 110. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and today's episode is part one in a two-part series on running biomechanics with Dr. Tom Hughes. He is a running biomechanics expert with a PhD in the movement patterns of the foot during running And he actually got into that research doing his PhD at uh, the University of Loughborough after having already worked as a medical doctor for quite some time. So that's really interesting. But he left medicine and got his PhD, uh, got coaching qualifications from British Triathlon and ended up founding Tri Mechanics, which is his uh, business, which is based in Leeds. And that's where he does his running um, analysis and helps athletes triathletes and runners run healthier better etc and i didn't really know from the start although i had a slight suspicion that it might be a long interview but i wasn't sure it was going to be a two-part episode but it ended up being uh, a long interview because tom had so much gold to share that we we ended up talking for quite some time and therefore i decided to split this interview into two parts so you'll hear the next part on the next episode, of course. And whether you're completely healthy or chronically injured, either side of the extreme, I can guarantee that you'll come away with some nuggets that can change your running for the better. I've already changed, for example, how I sit at my computer right now recording this uh, because of the interview with Tom, and that's something that we'll have in the interview either today or the next time. So before we dive into the interview, let's thank our sponsors that help keep the show up and running. First, we have Precision Hydration. They are the sweat experts. They get you hydrated and help keep you hydrated with their great electrolyte drinks of different strengths to match different sweat rates and sweat sodium contents. And some people have been asking about the fact that uh, their drinks have no no carbs in them, no no calories almost. And uh, the reason for this is that uh, they are the drinks are designed to be hypotonic for the fastest possible absorption rate, uh, so that you can get hydrated really really quickly and then the idea is that you get your carbs in the form of gels bars and other products instead and the advantage there is that the risk of gastrointestinal distress is much less this way by separating your hydration and and your energy intake so well what you use for hydration the ph product is uh, only meant to hydrate you and you're meant to get your energy from gels bars etc and and that not only ensures that you both optimize hydration and energy intake it also helps as i said minimize the risk of gi issues and as you know, all that Triathlon Show listeners can get their first f- box for free when they go to precisionhydration.com and uh, add a Precision Hydration product to their shopping cart and use the code that Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. This episode is also sponsored by Ventum. Warm welcome back as a sponsor of the show to the guys over at Ventum. They are the manufacturer of the speed machines that Ventum bikes are. You can find out everything about them on VentumRacing.com. But this episode, we actually prepared something a little special for you. A little cameo uh, with some exciting news that Ventum has to share today. Uh, So let's hear this little audio clip from Ventum. So Dia, welcome to That Triathlon Show. And uh, you have some really, really exciting news to share about uh, Ventum. Please go ahead and tell the listeners what that is about. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're here. We're excited to announce that Ventum is going to be expanding its Ventum Z line which is something we've been wanting to do for a while. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Ventum Z is different than the Ventum 1. The Ventum 1 is our flagship model. It's fully integrated. It is, um, it's also coming at a higher price point. 
The Ventum Z was introduced afterwards. It uses the same technology as the Ventum 1 uh, in terms of the, the molds and the shapes and the aerodynamic benefits. However, it's a different kind of carbon and there's less integration in the front end with the fork in the cockpit. But it was still a full DI2 and that was the Ventum Z. So we're gonna expand that line now and we're coming out with a mechanical version of the Ventum Z as well as the Ventum Z frame set. And the mechanical version is going to be $3,500 um, US. So we're really trying to hit uh, a price point that you know we've asked we've been asked to hit for for some time now, and the Ventum Z frame set will start around twenty eight hundred dollars. So again, as as we move forward, we um, we are trickling down the technology that we're getting from the Ventum One into different models. Yeah, so that's so, what so, we're doing right now. So, so for those listeners that are a bit newer to triathlon and don't know all the gear talk, then we're talking about uh, mechanical versus electronical shifting there. And the difference here is that this is a traditional mechanical shifting, which brings the price down to uh, to a really, really good level for a triathlon bike, especially when you if you go to the Ventum website and have a look at the images of what the frame looks like of Ventum, you can see that it's it's still not your ordinary bike. It's still like a super, super fast, and an advanced bike, but getting down to the price level of of most uh, entry level, quote unquote, higher entry level triathlon bikes. So, so yeah, who who do you think that the uh, the Ventum Z mechanical is uh, ideal for? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's definitely ideal for a more new person to the sport. I would say would would really enjoy it. Um, it's. Uh, it's definitely going to be much more affordable than the Ventum one, obviously. So it does open up the market quite a bit, but you can use it from a sprint distance to all the way to an Ironman or ultra Ironman. Uh, but definitely if you're newer to the sport, I think it will be a more appealing choice. I think if somebody's used to say a DI2 alt- uh, shifting to sometimes go back to mechanical, uh, can take some time to get used to. So that's why I also think someone who hasn't had a DI2 bike may, uh, but wants the aerodynamic benefits and wants to be on a Ventum, this will definitely be a a huge step up. And are all of the other things that uh, we're used to with Ventum the same for this uh, Ventum C mechanical? Like uh, you can order it online from your website and in the US and Canada, you can get it delivered and uh, set up and uh, you can even trade in your bike. Do you have and get a 110% uh, towards the purchase? Are all of those things still the same with the C mechanical? Yep, you're absolutely right. So in the US and Canada, you can do the trade up and finance program. Uh, You can get it delivered with our partner VeloFix, but we also ship all over the world. So, you know, we, uh, in fact, we've we've shipped some bikes to some very unusual places. Uh, So anyone can, can purchase this bike anywhere in the world. Absolutely. All right. Super exciting. And uh, of course, we'll have everything linked to in uh, the show notes and the episode description. And it's ventumracing.com if you want to go there directly. So thank you, Dia, for coming on and sharing this exciting news that really opens up the uh, the Ventum brand to to a wider uh, wider audience with uh, now covering a wider price range from more entry level to your flagship Ventum 1. That's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Michael. Wow, that is super exciting news indeed. This is Ventum, ladies and gentlemen, the premier triathlon bikes. And as I said, they can be found on VentumRacing.com. All right, that's about it. Let's hear this entry on Running Biomechanics with Tom Hughes. Today's guest on that triathlon show is Tom Hughes from uh, Tri Mechanics. Tom, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Really good, really good, and uh, very fascinated by this topic. Uh, as uh, I mentioned in the previous episode for the listeners that uh, just heard episode 109, uh, I'm very much on the edge of my seat to hear what you have to say because running biomechanics is a fascinating topic and, and you have a different angle to it that will be very intriguing to, to get to learn more about. So uh, let's start by just uh, discussing, you have a concept uh, or a sentence, uh, I should say, on your website that say, says that you're not teaching how to run, but you're helping the athlete learn how to teach their body to run, uh, basically. Can you break that down for us, what, what that means? Okay, so yeah, this is the, the way that I think about when it comes to kind of running is that 
running is obviously a relatively innate activity. It's something that we were designed to do. There's lots of evidence that shows that we were designed to be upright and that we were designed to use running both as a, a method of hunting animals possibly and transport and those things. So coming at it from that background and that idea that we were very good at running, that maybe it's actually our, our kind of lives that have changed that ability, so doing lots of things like sitting, then makes you think, well, actually we're trying to just return ourselves to how we were. The other side of that is that we, I believe that the way we run is a kind of product of you know, what positions we sit in and what we do in our daily life. So therefore, trying to forcefully change those things where maybe we don't have the, the control or the strength in the right places tends to just lead to more compensation patterns. Are you saying trying to forcefully change the running patterns themselves or, or the sitting or, or habits? Which one did you refer to in that instance? Exactly. Well, last thing is trying to change the running patterns without addressing the habits behind them that then lead to them, I believe just means that we just go around in circles. Right. So, so let's say you've got someone, I mean, a good example, let's say you've got a runner who's running very stiffly and you tell them, oh no, move your arms more or relax your shoulders. Well, why are they running stiffly? Why are the shoulders tense? Is it because their hips are unstable? Is it because, because they spend so much time in a certain position, let's take sitting as an example, the hips don't really function very well. So their body's tensing up because it doesn't sense that it's in control. And so forcefully changing and saying, right, we'll do this or do that or move that arm more, will actually just end up in being a compensation. So that you think of it more than, well, let's change the way that we've ended up that way. So working on that, that strength control and the, the habit side of things first. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So can, can you continue on, on that, uh, that trail and uh, maybe talk us through an example of somebody coming in and having some, uh, yeah, yeah. What, 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 do you, what is a typical example of somebody coming in and how do you then go about helping them with their running mechanics? Okay, so I mean, a good example I kind of mentioned there. So it's someone coming in and, uh, and saying maybe that they've got tight hamstrings. So the best thing, I always love the idea of, of tight hamstrings because hamstrings, they're often kind of it's prescribed to well, stretch your hamstrings, which is completely the opposite of thing what you'd want to do. Because why is the hamstring feeling tight? Now, is it actually shortened? Or is it the fact that that hamstring is activating, overactivating because the back and the glutes basically aren't really doing their job. And that side of things often comes from sitting. So a really good example is someone that sits in an office chair all day will often complain of their hamstrings feeling quite tight. And the key thing is, is that if they spend all day in that chair and don't address what they're doing on that front, then you can do as much hamstring stretching or kind of rehabilitation as you like, but it won't make any difference when they actually run. Because when you run, you're, you're in this state of being kind of mildly stressed. So your brain goes for the kind of easiest pattern or what it knows best. And for a lot of people, that is that sitting position. And so part of it is, is starting to right, address those habits and those things that went before, but also then thinking about, well, how are we putting things into the brain? How is the brain learning this? And how we need to possibly take the intensity down and actually help the brain rediscover um, how it basically how it wants to move and how it wants to move better. So going it from that, that perspective. So I tend to do a lot of assessments on, on basic movement. So for instance, one of the easiest things people can do is, is look in the mirror and go and stand on one leg and see what happens. And if they sway with their body weight over to one side, over the top of that standing leg, and then lift their leg off the ground, that's a good sign that the glute medius and the side complex of the hip isn't really working properly. And that's really common in a lot of adults that spend a lot of time sitting. So it's starting to look at how the, you can often see, I can often predict how people are going to run simply by how they do a few simple movements, like standing on one leg or, or like squatting. And those, can be, those movements can then be used by them at home to start addressing the issues and seeing whether those, the way they're addressing it in terms of the, the strength and conditioning and those things are actually making any difference. So can you say that again about the uh, standing on one leg? If what happens, uh, what, what's that an indicator of and how can you then go about correcting that? And, and then the same thing for squatting. Okay, so if you, if you stand in front of a mirror and then and look at yourself and then if you go to stand on one leg, most adults and most people I see, well, the first movement they do is this sway to the side. So they sway their body weight over the top of the leg they're going to stand on. And then 
when they feel like they've moved their body weight further enough across, they lift their leg off the ground. Now, contrast that with a younger child, and a younger child will be able to march on the spot and lift their legs off the ground with almost no sway in body weight. And the reason that happens is because when the younger child's doing it, the way that they lift the leg off the ground is if you imagine their pelvis is level and kind of flat, essentially horizontal to the ground, they actually hitch their pelvis. So they, they almost pull and push downwards into the standing leg with the glute medius and the muscles on the side of the hip. And that enables them to bring the other leg off the ground. So it's a kind of hard thing to visualize unless you're standing in front of that mirror right now. But the key thing is that when you spend a lot of time sitting and you tend to not use those side stabilization muscles, you tend to sway and lift instead. Now, the problem is, is that when you run, that manifests in crossing the foot. Into the so you see those people that bring the foot right across into the center. So, sorry, sorry there were, means... were some, some interruption there. That manifests itself in when you run in what exactly did you say? You, you, you do this crossover gait. Right. So crossover gait, where you bring the foot more into the center. Now, the reason that's so important is because if you keep doing that over and over again, that can often lead to Achilles problems and various other injuries. Because if you imagine the leg is now no longer landing where we wanted it to land, i.e. slightly uh, to the basically, not, not exactly shoulder width, but slightly inside of that. But now we're coming right across into the center. You can imagine the Achilles tendon is now at quite a significant angle. And that's why we often get diagnosed with overpronation. It's nothing to do with pronation of the foot. It's actually because of the landing angle created by that hip position. So it's a kind of knock-on effect. Yeah, and you would know about that because you've done your PhD in in the dynamics and mechanics of, of the foot in, in running. So that's something that we can maybe get into a bit later. But this is super interesting and practical. So, so okay, let's say this is a test that people can easily do right now in front of the mirror. And, and if they found, find that they sway sideways like you described, what uh, do you recommend then that uh, they should do to rectify those issues? Well, they need to start thinking about, well, what, what is the actual movement? What is actually going on? And the, what I often do is this the kind of learning process where they go through kind of learning how to do the hip hitch again. So there's an exercise called a hip hitch, which is basically learning how to, you stand on the edge of a step and you learn how to tilt your pelvis both down and up. So you kind of move it almost from kind of up and down, up and down. It's hard, I say, hard to explain without seeing a video of it. But when you see the video, you'll understand what I mean. Um, and that starts to engage that glute medius in a way that actually we use when we run. So when we, when we run, we land and we essentially hitch that pelvis so that that keeps our pelvis nice and level so that we can balance on one leg and not tipple over to one side. And that's the kind of critical thing. So you, so you learn the hip hitch and then you need to start doing certain one-legged work. And the way I do it is to do it with a, with a support. So when you do most one-legged work, let's say you were to do a one-legged squat, you'd often put the foot in the center to be able to support yourself and balance. Whereas all that does is actually reinforce that compensation pattern. Mm, that's very interesting. I'm just trying to think about how I would do a one-legged squat. I'm not sure that I would do it any differently than that <laughs> foot in the center that you just described. So, uh, yeah. but as... Exactly. Yeah, that, that can make you stronger and it will make the compensation shot on the muscles stronger, but actually it won't take away the compensation causing the problem. Mm. So so the, the squat then was one of the other movements that you mentioned that's uh, that's really important. So so how do you do a squat test? Is that with uh, a double leg squat or a single leg squat or do you use both? And can you take us through the same kind of journey here about the, the way you just described how you can uh, do that uh, standing on one leg test and, and how that can manifest itself in problems and how you can potentially correct those issues? Well, in terms of one legged squat, what you're looking for is obviously that body positioning when you start off where you actually go onto the one leg. But then also when you're going down to the one legged squat, if your knee is shooting inwards and you can't control it, that then again shows that you don't have that much control from those side muscles. So starting to learn how to go into slowly into that one legged squat, but keep the knee where it is nice and straight, but also learn how to then, often if the knee pops inwards, then you can put it back out again. And learning that control element is really important. So that's often a sign, as I say, what happens is most people, as they go into the squat on one leg, the knee basically collapses inwards 
And if you imagine, I mean, I describe this to people, if you're, if you're wanting to do a marathon, let alone an Ironman marathon, you're essentially going to have to hop to an off, off one leg for a very long period of time. And so if you can't even do a one-legged squat to that point comfortably with control, then you can see what's going to happen over and over and over again as you run. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, and then, and then, and then with the squat, the squat's an interesting one. A, a, a squat is normally a good demonstration of, of good hip mechanics. Now, most runners have very kind of what we call kind of tightened heel cords because, and that's actually quite a good thing sometimes because it can help increase that elastic recoil of the ankle. So I don't believe that we should be able to squat to the ground with our heels on the ground. If you're a runner, it's okay to, to basically bring the heel slightly raised off the ground. So either by raising it using um, something underneath your foot like a book um, or just bring your heel just slightly off the ground. And then that slow descent with control, keeping the back nice and straight. And that should be evident. But if you can't, if you're looking in a mirror from the side and you can't squat to the point where your, your thigh is parallel, then you probably have some work to do on your, on your back and your glute control. And that's the key thing is that it's a demonstration. It's not that you should not necessarily be able to you know, squat because obviously we're not doing that when we're running. But a squat is a good demonstration of how much back and glute control you've actually got. Mm. And and then if you want to, if you have a lack of control in the back and glute, what uh, would you typically prescribe to to those athletes? Well, it kind of depends on why that's the case. So if if there's someone that sits a lot, it's likely their back mechanics and their lower back mechanics aren't fully functioning, possibly because of the alignment of their spine. Now I'm not really fully into the whole. I don't believe in kind of chiropractors and, and adjustments because I don't believe that works at all. Not beyond about five minutes. What does work is learning how, again, like the hip hitch is all about learning how to tilt your pelvis, doing exercises that learn how to tilt your pelvis forward and back. So like a classic Pilates move of using the, the, the imagery of a cup tipping forward and back can really help to learn that movement. But there's another set of exercises, and I prescribe this set to all of my runners. There's a video on YouTube called Foundation Training by Eric Goodman. And it's about 10 minutes of going through basically lower back and glute activation work. And it's possibly the most beneficial 10 minutes of any exercise you will ever see. And if you're a sitter, it is an absolute guarantee you need it. And that's the key thing is that when you do that, you actually, you start realizing you can squat deeper because you, you, may, you get that back and that glute actually doing the function they're supposed to do. Okay, this is brilliant. I'm going to do that tonight, actually, and, and try it out. So, what was again foundation training by Eric Goodman? Was yeah, that Eric right? Good, yeah. If you look, search for him, he does a lot of work. He does TED talks about all about anti sitting. But yeah, if you go on YouTube, there's an 11 minute long video on YouTube. Now, it's obviously there. You know, it says that there is a risk because if you haven't done this before, you need to be careful. But most people I find accomplish it absolutely fine, um, and it's brilliant for working. It works on the foundation position which is this almost anti-sitting position. So you imagine that when you sit, you kind of round your bum and your pelvis and the lower back. Well, this works the other way, it almost tilts it the other way. So you have to really stick your bum back and out. And it works to kind of, it's almost like rebalancing the system and rebalancing that lower spine. So when you stand upright, you're, you're essentially straighter as opposed to, and I find when I do it, I stand taller and I stand more proud and open and it really helps that running posture. That's great. So, so going back to the initial question that you help uh, teach athletes how to teach their bodies to run, do you do that by these sorts of exercises if they have any, uh, any anything that's that's lacking functionally or or, or even yeah functionally mostly, and uh, and then you kind of see that their the running will then take care of themselves uh, itself if you can get these things right like you do these kinds of exercises to get more glute and lower back control for example if that's where you're lacking is that is that the correct interpretation of how you go about things exactly yes because that's the thing is that what i'm trying to do is i imagine imagine you know you watch you watch kids running they're not thinking about their form they're not thinking about how they're running they're just running and they're just and they're they, they're fantastically fluid and they just relax and, and actually if you put them into the right situation, most children have probably got a lot more fitness and endurance than most adults. Um, and that's the key thing is that we're just trying to return to how we were when we were fluid, when we could move. And the, this idea of flexibility and mobility is not something, they're, they're flexible and mobile because they've got control, because their brain 
doesn't shut their systems and their muscles down, which makes us feel like we're tight. So that's, I'm very kind of anti kind of static stretching because that's not a demonstration that a muscle needs to be stretched or pulled on. It's a demonstration the brain has shut things down as a protection mechanism. Whereas the kids, they don't think about that. They just run and they're natural and they move so well. So when you think about that and you try and reverse engineer that, you think, well, all we need to try and do is try and get the, the, those systems working properly again and then they'll just, you'll just run. Because when you run, it's, it's essentially it's driven by the, the subconscious, the unconscious brain, because it's too stressful to control all those movements. You know, as you come into land, there's thousands of, of intricate movements all going on at the same time. You can't control that. So you have to be able to move well, and then it'll just take care of itself. Well, that's what I, I believe anyway. Yeah, that that uh, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about some, uh, now that we know kind of your stance on, on this topic, what uh, are some things that you see in media, for example, uh, or, or hear people talking about that you would consider myths about running form and running biomechanics that, that people should uh, look out for and maybe get their filter up a little bit when they see those kinds of things? Well, I have a bit of an issue with things like, I mean, being told to run softly. Running softly is a real problem because most people, when they run softly, they land and they sit down. So if you imagine they land and they, they bend the knee and they sit down, they absorb all of that energy because they're told with this fear that the impact is a bad thing. Impact forces do not cause injury. I promise you that. It's inappropriate, inappropriate impact forces that go to the wrong place. We are designed to be able to absorb those impact forces, absolutely no problem. And the key thing is that with this idea of cushioning on shoes, we were sold this idea that, that we should be trying to get rid of them. So when people are told to run softly, they land and they relax and they drop and they slow their cadence down and they end up kind of just, and, and running then becomes a very stop start exercise, very muscle driven and doesn't make use of that elastic recoil that is like, that kind of ticking along and that running should be this, this kind of return of energy almost like little mini like kind of pogo sticks or springs in the foot and the, the lower leg that return that energy. Now, if you become fearful of that impact, you then will always diminish that. You'll always try and get rid of it. And actually, that can cause more damage to the hip and the knee because it can actually cause more absorption of the energy. So if you imagine you're listening to somebody, someone's running on a treadmill near to you and they're making tons of noise, that noise is the impact force, but that's coming back out again. You can hear it. Now, if that same person with the same weight and the same speed lands, but they, they don't make any noise at all, where has that energy gone? They've, they've absorbed it. They've absorbed it somewhere, whether it's into their, their shoes, if, you know, if they're lucky, or their joints or their tissues. So I, I really don't like when people are told to, because it makes them fearful of that impact force, when actually it's, it's all about feeling that force, reusing it and sending it back out again so that you don't absorb it. And when you do that, you not only get faster, but you actually absorb less energy that can cause damage to tissues and possibly injury. So that's one of my big ones. That's good. Uh, anything else that we, we should be on the lookout for in terms of myths about running form and biomechanics? I think thinking about things like a kind of forward lean is another one and these kind of mechanics is that trying to forcefully change that. Now thinking about forward lean may not be the worst thing if you sit back and it's a way of promoting bringing you taller and more essentially trying not to sit back. However, most people, when they think about trying to lean forward, they dip their head forward. And when you dip your head forward, you imagine your head is a really heavy ball on the end of a stick. As the head goes forward, the pelvis sits back. So this is what I see. As the head goes, if you imagine, if you, if you get a side-on picture of an elite runner, their head is directly over their shoulders, which is directly over their pelvis in one tall position. Now, they might have a very, very slight lean forward, but it's only very slight. And that's the critical thing is that when you try and lean forward, you almost invo invariably bend at the waist, tip the head forward, and that drops that pelvis back. So that's something that's, that's again, it's a, I like people just to consciously run tall, open up the chest. They can do this by doing an exercise at the start of running by taking a few big, deep breaths in through the nose that puts the chest in the right position. If you take it, if you do it now, if you sit there, you take a big, big, massive big breath in through the nose, instantly your chest opens up and you, you open up the shoulders, you open up and you're nice and tall. That's the way I want you to run. And then apart from that, everything beneath about your waist, you're not in control of anymore. 
The other myth that I've got to mention as part of that is don't think about trying to land a certain way. The way you land is a function of your way you're set up. If you're running nice and tall and your pelvis is in the right position and you've sorted out your back and your glutes, you will land on a mid-foot landing, probably around mid to four foot beneath your pelvis. That's the most important bit. doesn't matter whether you heel strike or anything as long as it's roughly beneath your pelvis. And that's the critical thing. When you try, people say, oh, I'm going to try and run on my forefoot, they try and run with their almost toes down and that causes injuries because they're trying to change something that shouldn't be, that should be a function of, of how your body's set up. Does that all make sense? Absolutely. And, and I think fortunately that there's been kind of a shift again in the last couple of years that we see more and more uh, people and media realizing that uh, that trying to run on the forefoot is not a good idea. And we see all this research coming out that uh, it has no impact on, on either performance or, or injury risk, how you land, as long as, as you say, you land with the foot beneath beneath your hips and uh, and and def- it's funny that you talk about running tall that's uh, a mantra that i use when when i run i just think run tall run tall because that's that's one of the few like form cues that i that i use but i think that's that's super uh super useful and and good especially in triathlon runs because after the bike you can easily tr- uh, tend to to lean forward at the waist as you say because you've been in that position on the bike so so then it's it's useful to to think about running tall to to get that that posture right when when you're running uh, all right so uh, what about who should consider uh, going to and get a running analysis done at a clinic like like yours for example is it just people that have issues maybe injury issues or niggles or can anybody benefit from from going and having even if you're running fine and you're completely injury free who who can benefit from it well the thing is is that what i i say that i offer is is a window that's the critical thing it's like any kind of testing you could say to people, let's say, let's say it's a blood test. You could say to the population, right, you're, well, you're all healthy um, or you're not healthy, right? We'll do a blood test on all of you. And what you'll find is you'll find people that are, they think they're healthy, but the blood test indicated that something was a little off. And that actually by changing what they eat or something like that, they might improve their health. So, and it's just a window into that. And that's exactly the same as what I'm doing, is that you've got a lot of people that come in that haven't had any injury issues, but they also maybe haven't done a lot of running or they haven't increased their mileage kind of yet, or they're wanting to do that. And therefore it gives that window into, yeah, everything looks good. Or no, if you work on these bits, you'll get a bit stronger and that'll make you a bit more resilient. Then obviously I see a lot of injury, kind of injuries as well and injured runners. So what I do with them is a slightly different tack. We say, well, you've got this injury. Let's try and search for the pattern. Let's try and search for the root cause of what led to it. And by looking at people, like, and that's the thing is they don't necessarily need to see someone like me, even doing a little bit of their own work, you know, getting an iPhone and recording themselves and starting to look at those things. Obviously, when it comes to the how to fix things, that may be where you need a bit more expert input. But actually, it can give, you know, I had someone in earlier today and she was telling me she's, she was so good on the, the mindfulness. So when I do the exercises, you're supposed to do them very mindfully with your, your eyes closed and really concentrating on the movement and it's slow movements. And she really got that. And she was on the treadmill. I have a treadmill set in front of a mirror. And she said, oh, it's amazing how much, how, how aware you become of your body when you can see yourself at the same time. And you're feeling on this treadmill. I can feel how I'm stiffening up on this side. And it, she, she got all of that. I didn't need to tell her that. But she saw it because she got the tool to do that, which happened to be running on a treadmill in front of a mirror. So that's the key thing is that this is all just a window into looking at how you move and all those things and helps you then. And that's why I've, I feel like what I'm doing, rather than trying to fix problems or anything like that, I'm, I'm trying to give that window and then give an education as to how to fix them yourself. Because ideally, I would want somebody to work at that, help learn from me how to fix themselves go away, learn how their body works and moves and never have to see me ever again. That would be the ideal scenario. So it's it's typically only one visit or do people come in maybe uh, a few months later for a follow-up or how does that work? Well, yeah, I tend to see people at least once or possibly twice or three times as follow-up, mostly because it it helps them stick with what they're trying to do. It keeps the motivation up if they come back and see themselves and they not only feel like they've improved, but then they see on the, the video that their hip stability and their, their pelvis isn't dropping down to the side and they suddenly get a boost of, you know, exactly the same thing happened this morning with that client. Her hip wasn't dropping anymore. 
And so she said, oh, I'm so glad that all that work I've been doing has paid off because they're sometimes doing these exercises that I've asked, I've asked them to do these exercises and they've bought into it. Now, if nothing changes or they feel like nothing changes, even if they do feel like they got stronger, if they don't see that, they'll often think, well, maybe I don't need to do them anymore. Maybe I should do this instead. And that's the key thing is that that's why I like to see them because actually it reinforces that. So they say, right, I'm going to keep doing them because they're working. And the other side of it is that I, I look on it as like, if you were told, if you were given a book and then told, well, in, in at some point in the future, you're going to have to do a test on what's in this book. You'd probably go home and you'd have your dinner and you probably would say, oh, I'll start revising it tomorrow. Whereas I'd like people, if I say to them, right, you've got two weeks. You've got two weeks to come back in and prove that you can do this. Because often this learning it's not, it's not strength-based, it's coordination-based. So sometimes you can get a benefit. If you do those, these exercises five times a day for three or four days, they'll have an effect. So it's all about number of, of events. It's all about the skill development. So if you tell them they've got to come back in, it's like sitting in the driving test. They have to do the revision. They have to do the work. Then they see the result. And that, that perpetuates that cycle of, him, of wanting to improve, but also being able to then see their improvement develop. So that's why I like to see people. But I, I, they, if they, I also say that if they're the kind of learner that wants a big dump of knowledge, I can sit there and I can say, right, do all of this and this will probably work. And if you go away, you can work on this. And sometimes that's what they would like to do. Mm, yeah. And obviously, if people are in the Leeds area, that's where you're located. So they can go and see you. And uh, we'll obviously link to all of your details on uh, on the show notes. But uh, in general, for people all over the world that uh, may be interested in getting a running analysis, uh, what uh, are the things to consider when when you select a service provider? Some recommendations that you have when when people, yeah, when people are looking for somebody to do a running analysis for them? So yeah, so you're looking for someone obviously with, with good experience in running in the field, but also thinking about they, they, you want someone that can, that can put all these different elements together. So when I talk about running, I talk about the fact that, that the job and the sitting and all those things um, essentially all factor into that. And you want someone that, that knows that. You want someone that, that, that asks you what job you do. If they don't ask you what job you do and they're looking at your running, then I think they're missing a big point. Because if you spend eight or nine hours of your day in a certain position, then that affects how you run. So if they just look at your just your running, or that's all they're purported to do, then I think they're not going to be very good for you. Because that's not going to be probably the bit you need to address. And it's the same way as if you had to go and see a bike fitter, and they just measured you and said, right, go out and buy and fit your bike in this way. You'd want them to work with your bike. You'd want them to work. You want them to assess your, you as a person, as an individual. But also maybe they'll ask, they should ask you what kind of distance, you know, if they didn't ask you what kind of distance of race you're doing, you know, are you doing Ironman or are you doing a sprint? Then again, they might be missing the point. So when you're selecting, you want to find somebody or someone that is, that is, that is encompassing all those elements because, you know, things like nutrition, all those things, they are all part of it. You know, if you've got a running injury, nutrition is as important as rehabilitating the injury because if you're not getting the amino acids in that, that actually support tender repair, like glycine and proline that you get from collagen and those tissues, or you're not getting anti-inflammatory foods that are helping, or you're being advised to take anti-inflammatory medication or ice the injury or do these things, then you might never rehabilitate it properly. So you need to have somebody, I, I try and offer this kind of holistic service because you know sometimes I've had people here and we've spent half an hour talking about diet instead of running. Because it's all part of it, and I think if you if you can't see if, if someone's not doing all of it, then they're, then they're not doing you a good service. So that's that's the kind of thing that I try and offer, and I try and get people to offer, um, because they should be able to go to this service and get kind of one stop shop of all these things. Because you can't look at running in isolation; it is a it is a factor of all those different elements put together. When you talk about the jobs and the sitting and uh, that sort of thing, that uh, sitting is is perhaps the most obvious one. But are there other things, other habits that affect how we run that in in our everyday day life? Well, I mean, I just want to say about the kind of sitting things. Actually, sitting itself isn't really a problem. It's like anything. It's the amount of time continuously being in one position. So sometimes standing could be a problem. So it's all about moving a bit more. The other thing is is what we're sitting in as opposed to just sitting. So office chairs that have lumbar support are the worst thing for the back. They're the worst thing for the back and the pelvis and the glutes, and they're the worst thing for a runner. If you, can, if you have to sit, sit on a stool, sit on something where you have to move around, 
that you have to create movement, you have to twist and get all that twisting movement back. Driving as well is another real problem because it puts you in one position. So think of it as I'm not going to be in one position for a long period of time, regardless of what it is, whether it's sitting, driving, standing or anything. So that's one major thing. The other thing is habits like going for a run and then sitting down or, or just stopping straight afterwards and not moving. That sends a really bad stimulus to the brain. Now, I don't, I'm don't. i not a big fan, as I say, of static stretching, but I think moving and moving yourself around after a run can be really beneficial, whether that is through stretching, whether that is through massage and these things. Just keep everything moving for a good half an hour to an hour. So that's a really good habit to try and add in. The other thing is things like hydration. We don't realize that, you know, there's a reason why when we get up in the morning, we feel like we're stuck together. It's because the tissues between basically where the fascia is and where the muscle is, they are only hydrated when we're hydrated well enough and we've actually created pressure in the muscle to push the fluid into that, that space. So when you get up in the morning, you feel stuck together. It takes a while when you're moving around to get feel like you can move again. Well, think about that when you run. You need even more of that movement. So make sure you're going into every run well hydrated, not having had one coffee and that's it. You know, hydrated well, that you're moving well, that you do a good movement practice before you start. So, you know, you should be practicing those squats before you start a run. So don't just get up, move around for two minutes, sit down, have a coffee, then run out the door and sprint straight into your workout because you're not really helping your body. It'll instantly go into a stress response. So getting that, those, those kind of habits, keeping yourself well hydrated throughout the day if you're going to run in the evening is really, really important. And the biggest mistake I often see is people, triathletes, doing training on the turbo in the evening when they are getting dehydrated because they're indoors and they've got a big fan on so they don't really sense it, but they lose a lot of fluid. Then they don't drink much afterwards because they're worried about going to bed at night and having to pee in the night. So then they get up the next morning and they're dry as a crisp. And then they go out for a run and all those tissues are all locked and stuck together you can imagine how how damaging that could be so i think those are the biggest habits i think yeah that, that's very interesting that that last point and i can definitely see that being being true uh, what about uh, if, if you have a, an office job and you're typically sitting for eight hours per day and you have a lunch break but but for many people you don't go go out of that chair for a long time and you mentioned that you want to to change position often so so how can you do that practically what, what would you say to a person that has an office job like that what what advice would you give them how often should they get up and what should they do when they get up and that sort of thing okay so firstly i tell them get rid of the chair so office chairs these ergonomic are often really expensive and they're designed and they're given to employees to stop back pain by you know they give employers do it to stop back pain but actually all they do is make the back pain worse it's a bit like an orthotic in a shoe it cradles and it doesn't, it makes the foot weak. And this is the same as the back. So get rid of the chair. Your employer, if you sign a thing saying, I'm happy to not sit in your ergonomic office chair, your employer will be happy. Every person I've said this to has gone away and changed their chair without any issue at all. So get rid of that big, that big office chair that swivels with you. Change it for a stool, no back, something where you have to perch. The best stools out there are called saddle chairs. Have you seen them? They're like a, a horse's saddle. Mm -hmm. actually and they're great they are absolutely brilliant because if you want to see what natural sitting posture should look like look at a natural horse ride like a cowboy and they sit with a very nicely straightened back not over straightened not up really tall not fixed very relaxed straight back no rounding no the lower back doesn't round at all and that's the critical thing is that that saddle chair is brilliant for that so then you sit on that chair and you have to activate and move. Don't bother with a Swiss ball because most people, when they, when they sit on a Swiss ball, on these, these exercise balls, after about half an hour, they fatigue and they start to really round into the ball and round their back and actually it causes more problems. So sit on one of those, those stools and then move as much as you can. Almost set yourself a timer in your mind of five minutes of literally, I'm going to move around every five minutes, even fidget. You, know, you don't need to get up and move necessarily, although that is ideal, but just fidget, just move around. Every time you pick up that piece of paper from the other side of your desk, rather than swiveling your chair and you know, move yourself, twist your body, move around. Because if you don't, the, if you, the best example I can give of this is sitting in a car seat. Not very long ago, I drove from where we live in Northern England all the way to Annecy in the south of France. And it involves a good five, six hour plus stint at a time of sitting in one position. And I felt really comfortable because my car seat is designed to hold me in one position. 
Yet after I got up, I couldn't move properly because my brain had shut things down because I was locked in that position for so long. Now, if, you, if I could have just moved around a bit more, I'd have felt absolutely fine. So that's the critical thing is just, just moving is, is the goal. Just fidgeting and moving as much as you possibly can rather than, you know, if you can get up and walk around, do that. You don't need to do anything special. You don't need to do anything that's particularly different. You just need to get up and move around. Okay, that's that's really practical and and useful advice. So shouldn't be very difficult for people to implement, which is often the best kind of advice because that's what uh, yeah people end up actually doing. And if it gets too complicated, then uh, then people don't don't do it and and you don't get the result. So so really appreciate that. That's uh, that's great. I hope that you enjoyed part one of this interview. And uh, as I said, you'll hear part two of this interview on Monday. So look forward to that. Make sure you subscribe to the show so that you don't miss it. And in the meantime, you can find the show notes for this episode as usual on thattriathlonshow.com. And if you have comments or questions, leave them there on that show notes page and I'll get right back to them very, very quickly. So uh, yeah, keep that uh, discussion going if you have anything and I'm sure that Tom can uh, come and answer some questions if you have questions for Tom specifically as well. One thing that I want to ask you before we end this episode is to please, if you can help me spread the word about the show, it really helps me get great guests on and and also rating and reviewing on iTunes to get it up the rankings on iTunes uh, because I believe it or not, there are quite a few people that I'd love to interview on the show. And I haven't managed to get them on. And at least in some cases, I have a strong feeling that it has to do with the fact that the podcast still isn't quite a household name in the triathlon podcast industry. So anything that you can do by spreading the word, telling your friends, just making more and more people listening to it. And also, if you haven't, please, please rate and review on iTunes. Uh, It's been a long time, especially in the US. I think it's been very quiet on the ratings and reviews recently. So so here's... uh, Call to arms to to all the U.S. listeners. Uh, you're many. You're the majority. So uh, please go and rate and review on iTunes or the po- Apple Podcast app, whatever they call it, or any other app where you can rate and review. Really. So if you can help me out with that, it really helps. It helps me get all the great guests I want you to hear onto the show. So it's uh, I, I think that's a great mutual benefit to that. That's about it. Let's thank our sponsors first. Big thanks to Ventum for supporting that triathlon show. Check them out on VentumRacing.com. And thank you to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. Remember, before you get your first box for free by using the discount code DRETTRIATHLONSHOW, it is recommended that you take their free online sweat test And that will tell you which exact electrolyte strength you should get to cover your uh, hydration needs, your electrolyte needs, based on your sweat rate and your sweat sodium content. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.